I might have a carnival game at Poultry Days where I'm on the mound and I'm just throwing pitches and people can put a dollar in and try to hit a fastball off me. <laughs> okay. We'll raise some money for the church. There you go. God has a dream specifically for you. And if you don't play your part, it won't get played. And if your part doesn't get played, I assure you, souls can be lost. The world doesn't need another John Paul II or Mother Teresa. The world needs you. And your ordinary life has an extraordinary mission. Now is your time. You're listening to the Extraordinary Mission Podcast with Dr. John Wood. Dr. John Wood is an optometrist, author, speaker, and saint in the making. He has published three books and speaks across the country, energizing the church to pursue our extraordinary mission. And now your host, Dr. John Wood. Welcome back to the Extraordinary Mission Podcast. I am John Wood, your host, and this is the podcast where we talk about our extraordinary mission of becoming the saints God created us to be, um, inspiring others, motivating others, especially if you're mom and dad out there. We hope to inspire you and give you some ideas and tips on raising your kids in the faith, inspiring them to become saints, because that's our dream as parents, to get our kids to heaven, uh, become saints. So we have a special guest uh, with these last couple episodes, Craig Stammen, uh, San Diego Padres, uh, both from the same hometown. We got uh, some same roots in Versailles. Uh, we've talked uh, um, in the last episode and also last year about some different virtues that have made you a, a great, great athlete. Um, those virtues also make you a great, great man, a uh, man of virtue, and um, you've been a great role model for a lot of different people. And so let's continue our series. Um, so far, we've talked about things like self-discipline. We've talked about um, sportsmanship, winning and losing. Uh, last time we talked, um, we talked about um, obedience and listen to the coach. Um, we talked about perseverance, passion, those kind of things. So I thought in this last episode, we talk a little bit about um, just doing things over and over, repetition, practice. You know, a great athlete doesn't get to where they're at without um, a lot of repetition, a lot of routine, a lot of doing the same thing over and over again, which can seem a little boring at first, but I think it's something that kids need to learn, um, you know, growing up, playing sports. I think it's a great virtue we can teach. So do you have anything, any, any routines that you've developed over the years, I'm sure, that you probably do every day that have probably made you better at what you do? Yeah, I, I mean, almost too many to talk about, <laughs> but um, you can... If you watch me over the course of 162 days, my goal is to be the same person on the first day as I am the last day. And that involves doing kind of the same things, you know, every day to, to be at my top potential for each game. So, I mean, I try to show up at the same time. I try to stretch out the same way, um, not superstitiously, but just because that's what I know will get me ready to play the game. Um, and so repetition has become and routine has become – Basically, who I am as a ball player, it breeds consistency, and I think consistency is what a manager or a coach wants in a player. He wants to know when he puts that guy in the game, he's going to get the same thing every single time. He knows what he's going to get. It's not going to be a flip of the coin. He's going to be good today or he's going to be bad today. And I think that's been one of my biggest attributes as a player is I've been able to be rather consistent. The manager can rely on me because he knows you know, what's going to happen. Yeah, so, you know, that, that consistency is, it comes from those routines. It comes from that repetition. It comes from doing the things the right way uh, every single day. And so, um, you know, getting ready for a game, you know, getting in the, you're in the bullpen. Um, one of the probably challenges, I guess, of being a relief pitcher is you don't really know if you're going to get in the game that particular night. But right. um, when your name is called, you got to be ready to go. And you certainly are, are a guy they call on a lot. So um, what take us through your bulletin, you, you, maybe your mentality and your routine of getting ready to go into a game each and every night. There's got to be some things that are comforting for you that kind of to get you ready to go, um, get on the mound and, and do your job and get some outs. Oh, yeah. And I think this is something that the younger players that come up to the big leagues don't really understand and they watch me every day, and they're like, why do you do this? Why do you do that? Why do you do this? And then I'm able to explain to them, and they're like, I need to start doing that because I'm not the same person. I'm not the same mentally uh, when I go in the game every single time. And for me, it is all about mentals, being in that same mindset uh, consistently. So a lot of the stuff I do is physical, but that physical stuff puts me in the right mental state. Um, so usually the first – uh, three to four innings, we're just kind of sitting there watching the game. You know, that's when we're everybody talks about the bullpen games where you're flicking seeds and chewing gum and making bubbles and, you know, whatever, telling stories and all kinds of stuff. Um, but usually, you know, hopefully the starters pitched 
enough of those innings that you don't have to get ready super quick. But depending on your role, and my role has always kind of been at any time, um, I've always decided that I'm going to stretch out. I'm just going to do a nice light stretch just to kind of get away from all the guys joking around, having fun, kind of get away a little bit, spend my own time to myself, but just do like a normal five to seven minute stretch. So I'll do that either, depending on my role, if I'm pitching the eighth, it's usually in the fifth inning. If I'm pitching any other time before that, I'm stretching in the fourth um, when our pitcher is pitching, whether it's the bottom of the fourth at home or top of the fourth at home or the bottom of the fourth on the road. Uh, so I'll do my little stretch. I'll do a couple jogs back and forth to end it. Um, and then I kind of sit back down, and then that's when I'm locked in. That's when I'm watching uh, the game really closely, like trying to pick up certain things. Um, really watching our starting pitcher to see if he's uh, laboring at all, if he's going to come out of the game soon or if he's going to start cruising uh, kind of thing. And once one inning is passed, so either if I stretch in the fourth, this is the fifth, or stretch in the fifth, this is the sixth, I'll get a baseball and I'll throw it up against the wall, I don't know, 10 or 15 times. So it's just kind of to get the – break up the arm a little bit, just get it just a little bit loose so that when you're called you can get loose a little bit faster. And sometimes that throwing is not against the wall – uh, it's with the outfielder in the outfield when we're on defense. Some, it just depends which stadium. Sometimes the bat boys throw with the outfielders, and then they don't need us. Sometimes there's, there's no bat boy, so they need a guinea pig reliever. Always so, wanted that job. Yes, exactly. So that's me out there throwing just to warm up. Um, and then by then, you know, I've got a little bit of a sweat going, and I'm, I'm ready to go. And at that point, I've got my sweatshirt on. Uh, things are ready to go. Now it's anticipating when I may be called into the game, and I'm always trying to watch the game. Like, could he put me in here? If this guy gets on, am I the one getting up? You know, who's the guy getting up? And whatever. We had a joke last year. Whenever the phone rang, all my bullpen mates just started yelling, Craig. It's Craig. <laughs> <laughs> and pregame, when we're taking batting practice, they're testing the bullpen phones to see if they work. They do it every single day. And so whenever the phones, the whole – bullpen yells Craig because <laughs> they were making a joke of how many times I was getting called to have to get yeah. warmed up which whatever it was a I don't know something I was proud of I guess in the end but something I may regret when I'm 50 and I can't throw anymore uh type of thing but and then it's you know you get the phone call and I've got a routine to warm up I throw three three balls off the mound with the crow hop which is just kind of running and throwing towards the catcher I get on the mound uh immediately and I'm throwing three Pitches to the outside corner, three pitches to the inside corner, three two seamers to the inside corner, uh, and then I'm throwing uh, two change-ups to the inside corner, two curveballs, two sliders, and then take a breath, try to catch it, and if I'm not in the game yet, you know, throw a few pitches here and there to stay loose. What's your favorite pitch? It just came to me. My favorite pitch, uh, you know, I love throwing my curveball, even though it's probably my third most effective pitch. <laughs> but I've thrown that since I was in high school. It's always been pretty good. It's just as major league hitters have gotten better, it has become not quite mm. as good type of thing. It was good against high school kids, college kids. Uh, but my slider and sinker are my two best pitches that get the most outs. Um, and they're my go-tos, but I still, in the back of my head, like kind of like striking people out with yeah. my curveball. <laughs> yeah. We like what we know, um, and we come from you know, when we become familiar with things. And, and, you know, when I'm watching a game and, you know, I'm watching my favorite team or whatever, I would much rather have uh, a Craig Stammen who's been in the league for 11 years be in there in a situation, which is probably why your the phone's always ringing, you know, that, you know, you got two outs and the bases are loaded and you need somebody to get an out versus a guy that he can even throw 103 mile an hour fastball because experience is huge and so um do, how does that build your confidence knowing you've been in the league 10 you know over over a decade you've done this a hundred times before and that repetition and all the the work that you've done does that build your confidence as you step on the mound you know i think in sports in general you can see the guys that, that have the confidence versus a rookie that maybe haven't you know i have the i have the ability i have the talent but i don't have the experience and so talk about how repetition is giving you confidence to to, to succeed yeah and you know I've been like you said played for 11 years but I still get the same nerves I got the first time I went in the game you know there's still that anxiety that fear of failure you know that isn't necessarily a good feeling and it's one of those feelings that you're like I want to get rid of as fast as I can but you also know that you've got to face your fear and so when I'm running into the game and in, going into the bullpen you know I've got my own routine that I'm saying in my head to pump myself up with positive thoughts and you know we talked about the eye of the tiger so i sing eye of the tiger when i'm running in because that gets me fired up and then when i get on the mound then it's like 
all right, now we're in desperation mode. I've got to get these people out. Then I start praying. (laughs) (laughs) So I've got a few sayings when I'm on the mound that calm me down and that get me ready to pitch, that make me realize, hey, this isn't just, you're not just the only one on the mound. You've got, you know, the Savior of the world on on the mound with you. He's right there with you. Whether he wants you to get him out or not, doesn't matter. But he's with you, and he's got your back. And so, you know, a couple of of the sayings that I say to myself is, you know, you haven't been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Um, and then another one, like you were saying, repetition, you know, do it like you've done it a million times. Cause I have done it a million times yeah. and I've been successful. So it helps you draw on those past successes um, and things like that. And so, you know, I'm, I'm quoting Bible verses and then my own pop up music at the same time. Go. They go hand in hand. It's perfect. Yeah. It's, <laughs> that's how you can draw everything together. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I think that, that, obviously build your confidence doing things over and over again. But um, a lot of times when we think of the word repetition, um, one of the the first words that come to mind is boring. (laughs) And when people look at Catholicism, they're like, wow, you know, doing the rosary, that just seems really boring. Going to mass, it's the same mass over and over. That seems really boring. And sometimes we get, you know, caught in that boring, you know, just that perception of it being boring. But that's really what builds champions. I think it was Larry Bird that said, you know, he's the greatest free throw shooter in the history of the, of the NBA, and he made 500 free throws every day. Well, that that just seems really boring to me. <laughs> but I got to believe that playing baseball is pretty fun for you. It's, it's, it's fun to go out there and compete every night, but it doesn't come without the stuff that maybe seems a little boring at first. Oh, yeah. There's plenty of boring things in baseball, and a lot of non-baseball fans would say it's boring. Um, but th- that repetition – you know, the thing that doesn't make it boring is it is because the repetition makes you better. Yeah. And if you want self-improvement, if I want to become a better baseball player, then repetition is the remedy. And so that's what makes it fun. It's like, I know if I can do this enough over and over and over again, I'll become really good at it. And the same thing is, is like going to church. You know, if I do this over and over and over again, my faith will increase and I'll get really good at trusting God and be able to have him live through me you know, throughout my life. And that's a pretty special feeling, you know, because we've all been there in our beginning of our faith journey where we didn't necessarily feel that way. Yeah. And as we go and repeat it, and repeat it, and repeat it and grow stronger and grow stronger and grow stronger, it isn't for not. It's for something that's really special so that, you know, when we are called to heaven, you know, well done, good, my good and faithful servant. You know, that's what we're, you know, hoping for. And that's what the repetition eventually will lead to. Yeah. And it's a a lesson in sports, but I think that's another one that parents can apply when talking to their kids and trying to get them to do things. And I tell parents all the time that repetition, especially for kids is so powerful, the way their minds work, the way their experience of the world works. Um, You know, if we're trying to take them to mass once every four or five months, they're just, they're not going to get it. They're not going to cooperate, but doing things over and over and over again, they love what they know. Um, especially when we're little. So, right. And I, and I think if they see mom and dad doing it repetitiously, you know, and I'm my child, my oldest son is almost two years old right now. Like he watches me do things and can repeat them immediately. And so if he can do that at almost two, still one, you know, what can a 10, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 year old do watching me go to mass every day, participate, sing all the songs with my beautiful singing voice? Yeah. <laughs> That's not beautiful, <laughs> you know, but make a joyful noise. Yeah. Uh, you know, know all the prayers, know them by heart, you know, or even open the book to all the readings every time. Like, what is that showing them just by my repetition? And so I don't think, you know, we talk about our children. Repetition is with the adults. If the adults are repetitious, so will the children follow. Yeah, so doing it with the kids, that repetition with them, really, really powerful. So let's let's turn to the, the final thing I wanted to talk to you about, which I think um, in Major League Baseball, I think you're probably may, maybe – you know, really well known for if you just read any news article is just teamwork. You know, Catholicism is a family. It's a team. And we're not made to do this journey all by ourselves. And, and sometimes when I was running races, you know, you feel like you're on an island. But even then, it's my teammates pushing me. It's the, the drive to, to help my team win. And, and you've been known as a, a really great athlete. And the San Diego Padres um, just signed you again after three years. Um, you know, a lot of, lot of different options. You were a free agent. But you had said in, in your interviews that they – they were in communication with you the whole time um, that they wanted you back, and I got to believe one of the biggest, you know, you know, reasons they want you back not only your longevity and your success and how well you've pitched, but you make everybody else on that team better. Like they're not just getting the great, you know, individual player; 
they're actually getting every other player on their team, and especially in that bullpen, they're they're raising their level because um, I think you influence them quite a bit, and, and you seem to take that role very seriously as a leader on the team. So talk about um, you know your approach to being a good teammate and helping lift other people up as well. Yeah, I, we, me and my agent were talking when we were negotiating the contract. We said, well, they're probably paying me a million dollars. I'm talking that like it's easy, but that's baseball, whatever. They pay me a million dollars to pitch, pay me $3 million to talk to the younger kids. <laughs> <laughs> so that – I mean, us joking about that, that's kind of how I view that role is, you know, I do all right on the mound pitching, doing my own stuff, but um, they've got a lot of young, talented players coming up through the system, and, uh, you know, for them to be, to reach their potential, we want them to be able to become professional and know how to do it, gain that experience a little bit quicker than it is than actually having to go through it. So a guy like me, having me around can help those guys, you know, learn what I've learned in the past. Hopefully they can learn it a lot quicker than I did and then get to experience some of the stuff I've got to experience playing baseball. You know, I got to play in the playoffs, win divisions, pop champagne, um, got to have my first win, major league debut. All that stuff is, is really fun and cool. And I want those guys to experience the same thing. And that's what coming, coming back to being a good teammate is, is wanting the best for your fellow teammates and not just for yourself. Um, now, will I have fun along the way doing that? those things? Yeah, because I'm a part of the team too. But if I can enjoy those other guys' success, I too will enjoy you know, success immensely. Yeah, and I think that's powerful just uh, listening to interviews that I've, I've kind of looked up. Even on the way here, I was just kind of looking up different interviews that I've seen some of your teammates um, talk about. Like some of the rookies uh, just said, you know, if they have a question, they, they go to Craig. That Anything on about his traveling on the, you know, about – warm-up routines, and, and I think it was Trey Wingetter, he said, you know, I look at Craig and he does the same thing every day, and I look at that routine and I just want to do what he does because he's always doing the right thing. He's always, you know, making that. And even Kirby Yates said, you know, if I have a question, you know, I go to Craig, you know, ask Craig <laughs> about, what, about golf or whatever else. Um, they're coming to you, and I think that's a powerful statement that your teammates, uh, it was one interview, uh, you talk about the phones always ringing, they're always saying, Craig, you know, but I actually saw one of the, one I can't remember who was pitching, but they're talking about Andy Green was going out there and they're getting ready to pull him. And he's like, look at that guy over there in the bullpen warming up. He's pitched how many innings this year? You don't want to make me bring him in. And that was like, that was enough motivation to like, all right, I'm going to get this guy out. Although you probably wanted to come in the game. So yeah, well, there's a few times that I could use a day off, yeah. but <laughs> for the most part, I would like to come in, but you know, that's, I've been lucky to be in a place. San Diego has been that place where I've had a little bit more, I don't want to say clout, but a little bit, people look up to me. I've had that position on the team, uh, a powerful position on the team that can go either way. It can be you can influence people in a bad way or you can influence them in a good way. Um, but I take it very seriously, and I think, you know, the ultimate leader is is who we look up to, and that's Jesus. And he was a servant leader. He he wanted the other people to – he wanted them to know that he cared about them more than he cared about him, his own self. And that's essentially how you kind of treat the other guys on the team is you want them to know that you care about them and love them if not more than yourself or just as much. And when they finally realize that, or when you show them that love, then they realize like, all right, he's not just feeding me this stuff to feed me to try to win a baseball game. He's feeding this stuff because he wants me to be a better man. Yeah. And when that kind of clicks, then that's when you see teams win the World Series. You see that team camaraderie. You see that team togetherness because they care about each other so much that who cares who gets the credit? We want the credit. Yeah. And I imagine that in some instances, it's got to be tough, especially when you're first coming up and it's kind of like you're almost competing against your teammates. I mean, when you're, when you're in the minors and you're going to get a shot, you got to be looking at everybody else around or how good's this guy doing? Are you going to bring me down? Or are you going to bring that guy down? And I, I imagine there's got to be a challenge there because baseball's filled with a lot of individual statistics. I mean, you guys keep track of everything and ERAs and whatever letters, ever else, whips and everything else, <laughs> yeah, you know, more so, than I can uh, keep track of. I don't know if that is, is helpful for you. Uh, in, in a sense, I think it drives you. We talked in a previous episode about the scoreboard um, that it's important because it motivates me. It sets a standard. It gives me uh, something to, to set a goal. But how do you find that balance of um, reaching my own individual goals, but still putting the team first? Yeah, you, that's a good question. And it's especially tough in the minor leagues because you are literally competing with all those guys to get the few major league spots that will be available when you're finally ready. And I remember a, a coach we had in Savannah, Georgia in low A baseball, and we were on a big losing streak and team wasn't very good. And he, he sits us all in the locker room and he goes, look around. 
There might be one. There might be two, if you guys are lucky, in this whole entire room that are going to make it to the big leagues. And I'm looking around like, uh-oh, there's a lot of other guys that are better <laughs> than me in here kind of thing. And it ended up being one, two. I think there was three guys that actually made it to the big leagues off that team, which is kind of crazy. At the time, you're thinking, this guy's good, that guy's good. This guy got drafted high. He got a high signing bonus. All these guys are going to make it. Um, but then you started realizing like how guys kind of fall off. Some guy gets injured. Another guy's just a terrible teammate. He's only for himself. And somehow those guys never make it. Yeah. You know, it's funny how it always works that way. But the guys that really are super selfish about it end up falling by the wayside because when you try to do it by yourself, it just doesn't work. But the guys that are, are good teammates that try to help the other guy that are in it to win the game, not just to be successful themselves, those are the guys that tend to keep moving up and they tend to be on successful teams. And every team wants players that have been on good teams. And so when you be, when you try to be a good, great teammate and you are a great teammate, that makes other people want to be around you and therefore you get to play a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, and you're early in your career. Uh, did you have uh, a couple people in particular maybe that mentored you more than, than most that gave you and showed you how to do things the right way, showed you the ropes and how to survive and thrive um, in the major leagues that give you that, that arsenal of things that you want to pass on to other people? Yeah, there's a, there's a few guys uh, that come to mind right away were LeVon Hernandez, uh, Jason Marquis. Those two guys uh, were in the big leagues with me in 2010, uh, 2000, 2010 and 11. Those two guys really kind of brought me under their wing and showed me what it's like to be a professional, how, how what you do to be a good teammate, what you do to be a great player, you know, individually. And part of being a great teammate is taking care of your own abilities as best you can. You know, being a little bit selfish in your preparation, but at the same time, caring about your teammates. So, you know, there's two parts to it. Care about your teammates and then also caring about your teammates enough to do what you're supposed to do on and off the field. Um, so they showed me those, those kind of things. And then as I got older, um, you know, guys like Adam LaRoche, uh, Brad Lidge, uh, Miguel Bautista, um, trying to think of some other guys. But those guys really showed me what it's like to be a professional. And then Adam especially – Show me what it's like to be a Christian man, a Christian father, a uh, Christian dad, um, husband, and show me how you could portray that as a baseball player too. Still be intense, still be out there to win, you know, cutthroat attitude, but also do it in a way that honors God. And so Adam was a really big mentor and not only my faith journey, but my baseball journey also. And he ended up being, he was the guy that hit the first home run off me. Got my got, gave up my first hit too, so he's been a big part of uh, my baseball journey. <laughs> well, actually, uh, we were in a, a pre, in another episode. You know, I just talk about the guys that I used to run against in high school, and they're my opponents. And you know, you sometimes you, you you want to avoid those guys, but they're actually the guys that push you and challenged you to to be to be great to 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 get better than you can push yourself. And I think that's the role of a teammate is to 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 push each other and, and reach another level that, you know, if I'm out training for a race all by myself, I'm never going to reach that level unless I have teammates um, and people I care about around me kind of helping me. Right. You know, level. if you're running a mile and the fastest anybody else is running is, I don't know, four four minutes and 45 seconds, that's all you really have to be. You just have to be yeah. 444. But if you got somebody that's running – you know, 405, you got to run a 404, exactly. you know, that pushes you a harder, helps you reach your potential. And I think that's what being a great teammate is, is finding a way to push your teammates to their, to reach their greatest potential. Uh, even though it may be easier not to quite push that hard to get to that point. And I think that's how human nature is to, you know, just get by at the bare minimum, but you know, we're called to do a whole lot more and that's to reach our ultimate potential. And that's what being a great teammate kind of is. Yeah. And sometimes that involves, you know, maybe, um, you know, kicking people a little bit when they're being lazy um, or just encouraging people when they're getting down on themselves. And you probably have to find that balance. And you've probably learned that balance uh, working with some really young pitchers and <laughs> people coming into the league. Yeah, I think I've failed at that a few <laughs> times. Uh, as, a, as a leader, you know, as a captain on a team, you know, I've failed in creating that accountability or at least using that accountability the correct manner. You know, screaming at somebody and telling them that they're completely out of line is not always the best way to do yeah. it. Some people take that well, and some people do not. And I think knowing those certain situations, when to use uh, that passion, 
uh, in that way are far and few between, but it can be used for your benefit. Yeah, it's never one size fits all. Every individual is different. And so you got some different individuals that you'll be working with this year, including a new manager. So I, I imagine after having the same manager for a few years, you probably knew when the phone was going to ring and, and when your name was going to be called, but that'll be something different that maybe you have to figure out this year. Right. And every season's a little bit of an adjustment. Um, you know, I can even talk 2012. We had Davey Johnson as the manager and my mom, who she knows baseball a little bit, but she could almost predict when I was going in the game. Yeah. She knew if such and such was starting pitcher, I was going in the game. She even talks about it today. She goes, that was so easy. How did he know? How did he do that? I even knew when you were going in the game. And then, you know, same manager, very next season, it was a little bit, it wasn't quite as, as routine as that. We didn't have good a season, you know, probably because of that. But um, she's like, what happened to that last year? I knew exactly when you're going in. Now I have no idea when you're going in. Um, so that'll be an adjustment this season with the new manager, but it is what it is. That's, that's baseball. And you know, enough, you've got to be adaptable. That's yeah. a, a talent that everybody needs to have. You got enough tenure now, don't you get to decide when you go in? <laughs> I came to a couple games and I told you to make sure you play in those games, and those are the games. You know, actually, one of them was a bullpen day, and I was like, man, you got some strings you can pull. <laughs> and got in, pitched a couple innings, and so yeah. Well, I pitched in almost fifty percent of the games <laughs> last year, John. So it's yeah. easy to yeah. <laughs> you had a fifty percent shot. Fifty percent shot. So, but I got one where you pitched multiple innings, which is not something you did. You're right. Day, You're so, right. Hey, you, you hit the jackpot. There's been several people i know that have come to over 10 games that have never seen me pitch yeah and you know you've been to a couple and you've seen me pitch every time <laughs> yeah you, you did pretty well each time so which uh you know so i should get so you should i should get more tickets games. more games <laughs> more tickets so but you know thanks for everything you do craig i uh, i love talking to you i love telling you know hearing about your story and your experiences in major league baseball and and how you do things the right way i think you're a great role model for not only your teammates but um, you know, young kids growing up around here and people that follow you. It's fun to follow you through the season. Um, you're staying on the West Coast. It's going to be tough, but it's okay. I think uh, the Padres got some great things happening, and uh, I'm excited about the next couple years. I think you guys can do some great. Obviously, everybody's goal is World Series. I know that's on your mind. I know that's probably something you want to accomplish. You know, you, you shouldn't be playing baseball if it's not. Yeah. You know, well, I had. You know, the funny thing you talk about being a great teammate. I had one of the young kids that came up this year's rookie year. And his dad played the big leagues, and he said, yeah, my dad would jump team to team searching for that World Series ring. So when I signed back, he texted me back, and he says, hey, we'll get you that World Series ring, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So that's, you know, that to me, he's being a great teammate to me, you know, thinking of me in that situation too. But it also shows, all right, maybe I have talked to these guys in the right manner to where, you know, they're willing to, not, you know, everybody wants to win the World Series, but at least that's on the forefront of his mind. It's like, let's get the old man a, a World Series ring. <laughs> awesome. So we'll be we'll be watching you. We'll be praying for you again. I told people last year, we'll tell the same thing. Um, you know, when you see Craig go in the game, let's throw up a Hail Mary for you. Give you all the prayers. I'm sure that helps. Um, I got one little one last question, one last uh, thing I want to I want to ask. Um, uh, you know, last year I, I we talked a little bit about my failures at the the Catholic Athletes for Christ um, wiffle ball tournament where I struck out <laughs> several times. And I went back this year. You weren't there, but um, you you can ask uh, Trevor Trevor Williams and the guys that were there. Um, actually, he was pitching, and uh, I had three consecutive hits, and I was I was doing pretty. You got well. a hit off a major league pitcher. Uh, yeah, three in a row. So and he was throwing <laughs> me some junk and everything, but I I adjusted. I made the adjustments, and so my. My, my request is maybe not this year, maybe maybe after you're retired because I don't want I don't want you to get injured or anything, but I want a shot at a major league pitcher. I want you know, I want a ball league diamond. I want you everything right. you got. Don't take it easy on me. I well, want to we'll, see the fastball and yeah. the change up and you've never beamed it. How many people you don't beam people very often? You got pretty good control, right? I've hit a few, but I don't want to get hit. Absolutely. I've hit a few. I've hit a guy in the neck before, <laughs> you know. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> You know what? We need to make a podcast out of it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I just, I want a shot at the major league pitcher. All right. So whenever you retire, cause I want I you. I might have a carnival game at poultry days where I'm on the mound and I'm just throwing pitches and people can put a dollar in and try to hit a fastball off me. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll look at that. We'll over. raise some money for the church. There you go. That sounds good. So, uh, you know, make a wish foundation, you know, I want, I want that, I want that opportunity. So someday, um, you and me, I'm going on. I'm going to get a hit. Mono mono. Let's do it. All right. So, all right. Thanks. I'm not going to race you. That well, We will not. I won't return the favor and try to race you. <laughs> That's all right. I don't want to race anyway. <laughs>
All right. So well, thanks a lot, Craig, again, for everything you do and for the great role model that you, role model that you are for everybody. And uh, good luck this year, even against the Rays. I'll be rooting for you when you're playing against my favorite team and um, hope you do great things. Thank you. All right. So we're going to sign off for today. Hopefully you parents and, um, and kids out there, you've gotten some good advice from, from Craig Stammen. Um, until next time, I just want to remind you that you're made to be saints, so just try your best and trust in God's grace to do all the rest. The Extraordinary Mission Podcast was brought to you by the Deep Roots Club, a group of people investing their time, talent, and treasures into helping today's families build deep roots of faith that can weather any storm. Find out more at www.extraordinarymission.com get involved.